We talked about environmental controls. Let's now talk about network security devices and just networking components in general. So let's talk about firewalls and perimeters and DMZs and, and wireless and Bluetooth and networking components. We've had a little bit of an introduction to it. And let's talk about intrusion prevention and detection. Now, when you have a network, just like if you have cameras around a facility, that's what intrusion detection is. It's basically putting cameras in key spots in your network. And they aren't cameras, but they're devices, usually computers with software on them, that are capturing all the traffic that goes by. So where do you put intrusion detection? You put it in all of the major areas of traffic like right behind a firewall, right at a VPN server, right where all the servers are, where um, all the big switches and routers are, all the big connections. So we put these cameras, as we will, uh, these intrusion detection devices. There's a distinction between intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems, IDSIPS. IDS generally captures and logs. And what you'll do with an IDS is you'll plug it into a port on a switch and you'll tell it to, you'll, you'll configure the switch to copy all of the important ports, like the ones connected to the servers and the firewall and VPN, whatever, to that particular port so that the IDS can capture all of it and store it in a log. A good IDS will also have a console that will show um, alerts and alarms. I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that. This looks like an attack. This is unusual traffic. But generally, these alarms don't do anything. They simply alert and they log. And then you can examine it later, or you can just keep an eye on the console and then investigate if you want. An IPS, intrusion prevention, is basically an IDS that's a little smarter. An IPS can adapt to whatever is going on in the network and in most cases, we'll tell the firewall, hey, I see weird traffic coming in, why don't you choke it off? IPSs are really great in that they are very proactive. They don't depend on the administrator going along and going, huh, I think something funny is going on there, let, let me investigate. Instead, they react. However, the problem with an IPS is it can react in the wrong way. If you set it up to be too restrictive, you could have started something brand new, like for the first time you're having this video teleconference across the whole network and everybody's involved, and the IPS goes, I've never seen that kind of traffic, chop, and the firewall cuts it off and suddenly the, the teleconference goes off. So you have to be careful in how you fine tune an IPS, but it's meant to be more proactive and it's a smarter version of an IDS. We already know that we need antivirus systems. Now, usually, we will just go to whatever our antivirus provider site is, website, and just download in the background on a regular schedule updates. In a larger enterprise, you probably instead have a single server, a dedicated computer in your network, and it's downloading the updates, and then you check them out. And then it can push those updates to um, all of the subscribing computers. So we can either have all the computers go out and download themselves, or we can download once. And that can include also patches and service packs, not just simply antivirus. Um, firewalls. We're going to talk about firewalls in greater detail. But a firewall is basically a router with a whole bunch of rules. And a firewall, as we said before, sits at your front door and controls traffic going in and out of the network to the internet. You can place a firewall anywhere you like, but that's generally where we think of putting a firewall is right at the edge of the network in our connection to the internet. We're going to examine firewalls in much greater detail soon. And then a type of placement or positioning of firewalls is something called a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. And that's usually where you have two firewalls and you have a special little perimeter network in between. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. So different security methods. Let's talk a little bit about some of the security protocols. And when I look here, I see several. There's Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. And if you've ever gone shopping online, you have seen the little lock and you've seen the um, browser that starts with HTTPS. Well, browsers speak a language. 
HTTP, and they speak other languages, but that's their primary language. HTTP was meant to be in clear text, not something you want to be using if you are um, sending credit card information um, shopping online, or if you're logging in with a username and password at your bank. So HTTPS is the secure version of that, and HTTPS uses a slightly lower level protocol called SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, which basically manages the encryption for what's inside of the content that you're sending up or down. And the two work together. So HTTPS is the language of the browser asking for a specific type of encryption protocol, SSL. SSL, as I had mentioned before, has basically been superseded by something a little bit more robust called TLS, Transport Layer Security. And the two, in terms of browsers, are generally backward compatible, and, um, but TLS is now the new version taking over for SSL. TLS is also sort of a broader range protocol. It allows us to not only have secure web sessions, but also secure methods of authentication. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of this class to talk about that, but TLS, we use it to make secure connections between email servers. We use it to um, make uh, secure um, authentication connections as well as secure browser connections. So these are some of our higher level security protocols. We have a concept called Network Address Translation, or NAT. And NAT is a, it, it serves two purposes. One is the whole internet uses a series of addressing called the IP address. And the IP address, in fact, we can actually show an example of that right here. In an IP address, all computers, all devices that get on a network these days have an IP address. And an example of an IP address on even this computer is this right here, the IP version 4 address, because we are in version 4, we're transitioning to version 6. It's a little beyond the scope of this class to talk about that, but basically we're running out of version 4 addresses. And you can see here that the address here is 10.0.1.28. IP version 4 addresses always have four numbers, and the um, generally the first three, but it depends, and again, it, it's beyond the scope of this class to get deep into IP addressing, but generally the first three numbers refer to your network, and that's analogous to like the street that you're on. And then the last number refers to your particular computer, smartphone, um, whatever it is, laptop, tablet, whatever, phone, um, whatever network device. Uh, so we, we tend to, if we're on the same physical network, share the first three numbers, and it doesn't have to be three, but that's very typical. And then the last number, each one has to be different. It's kind of like we're all on the same street, but each individual machine or device has to have its own little house number. And that's the idea of the IP address. It, it gives us uh, a, an ability to be unique in the world. Above this, you can see something that starts with FE80. That's an example of an IPv6 address. It basically, with IPv4 addresses, in theory, you can have 4 billion, but in practice, not that many because of the way the math works. In um, IPv6, because we're running out, uh, in theory, you can have 340 billion trillion trillion addresses because it's such a much longer number. Down here is another example, this one that starts with 2001. Just to let you kind of see IPv4 and IPv6, take a Network Plus or a Microsoft or a Cisco class if you want to explore these more. But anyway, um, we need IP addresses, but here's the thing. Not too long ago, it was recognized that we're running out of IPv4 addresses. So Cisco and a couple of other organizations proposed that we set aside certain blocks of addresses to be used internally only, and they can't be used on the Internet. And then all organizations can freely use them and reuse them and reuse them. But the thing of it is is that when you use these private IP addresses, you have to still somehow be unique if you're going to get on the internet. And um, so what we do is we have a router do conversions. As I start with a private address, my private address gets converted to a public address when I go out on the internet. I can show you an example of this conversion here. 
um, if we take a look, we can actually go to a website such as whatismyip.com or ipchicken just to see the public address as opposed to the private. Now you saw that my private address, and let me just bring it back up here, you see that my private address is 10.0.1.28, but it has been translated to 97.78.80.182. So as my traffic has gone out, my little packets have gone out, they have had their addresses translated at the front door, at the router, at the edge. And so to the internet, it, this, it looks like my address is this. It's a public address that I can use. And I'm only borrowing it as long as I'm out there. When I'm done, someone else will use it. And in fact, there are mechanisms for us to share them. Um, and we can, we can all share even the same address. So we go from the private address here to the public address here. So that is the idea of network address translation. This task of NAT is done by routers and firewalls typically. Um, and uh, that's usually an edge device that connects us to the internet. We also have this concept of virtual private networks or VPNs. And we had talked about earlier, I'm working from home, I want to use the internet because it's cheap to make a connection to the work network, the corporate or organization network. But I can't send my traffic in clear text, I need to encrypt it. There are a number of VPN protocols. Um, here are some of the more common uh, implementations. There is a very popular Microsoft-based VPN protocol called the Point-to-Point -point Tunneling Protocol, PPTP. Uh, the PPTP encrypts, it does not digitally sign. There's a very popular vendor-neutral one called L2TP, Layer 2 Transport Protocol. It both encrypts and digitally signs. Actually, technically, L2TP by itself doesn't encrypt, it signs. But it uses another one called IPsec, IP security. That is actually the foundation for m the most common VPN um, client tools and client products. Um, IPsec is the most common VPN protocol. It is used by L2TP to actually do the encryption part. IPsec by itself can encrypt and digitally sign. You might say, well, if IPsec does it, why do you need L2TP? Sometimes you want L2TP to just um, sign something or just encapsulate and uh, not necessarily even encrypt. In, in certain situations, we might want that. Like maybe we want to send something that's non-IP based across an IP network. And then a very common one now these days is using SSL or TLS based VPNs. It's, it's much higher layer protocol and it basically uses SSL and TLS web-based technology to encrypt uh, your content, your payload. So these are very common um, security methods here. Security protocol, the idea of translating our IPs. You might think, how does translating an IP act as security? Well, the way it works is that um, if I have a hidden private address that's being translated, nobody out there knows my true address, and so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hidden. So it's, it's a sort of a simple um, uh, security mechanism. So the next thing we're going to talk about is a little bit more about how these things work, and we'll look at some diagrams.